Hi everybody. I want to talk to you today about the Enlightenment. And like I said in the introduction, my goal for this is to sort of summarize chapter three for you, give you a better understanding of just how influential this time period was. So I want to talk to you about what I've separated this into several parts or short videos so as to try to make more sense of it. This one, this first video I've called uh, part one, WTF to influences. Now, when I, when I say that, you might be wondering, just what am I talking about? Well, when, I, when we talk about the Enlightenment, when you looked at chapter 17 and when you looked at the topic for week three, you might be like, well, WTF, what's the Enlightenment? Well, the Enlightenment was a time period in history that basically changed the way people viewed and thought about the world. What they did was these, these thinkers they began challenging the way things used to be. Or, like we've talked about in class, they challenged the old way of thinking, or the old regime. And what they did was they were inspired by the scientific revolution. That is, the, the works of Isaac Newton and others, which we'll talk about in a moment. As one philosopher, Immanuel Kant, he described this time period as a time when, quote, man's, a man emerged from his self-imposed immaturity. So basically, when we talk about the Enlightenment, we mean this is a time period or an intellectual movement when thinkers, be, when important people began to question the way things were. So who were these people that I keep referring to? Well, no, they weren't guys like me. But what they were is they were people who favored change, they championed reform, and they advocated for toleration. These are things that we're going to talk about as we go through this chapter and give you a summary. They could be found at universities. Some of them were professors. Some of them were just regular um, writers. Um, and others and other influential people in their in their writings. What they did was they supported the idea of the expansion of trade. They wanted to improve agriculture and transportation, and the idea of uh, a movement of ideas. So when we talk about these thinkers, there's a fancy word the book uses: philosophes. And philosophes, as you can kind of think of like a philosopher, well, this fancy term, philosophes, I'm going to use it interchangeably with this idea of, of these thinkers or these writers. Or, so the book uses this, I kind of think of as a silly term, these philosophes. Well, the, these philosophes, like I said, they believed in change and reform. And they believed, they thought that these two things were possible and, in fact, desirable. So despite the name they really weren't so much philosophers as they were men who sought to apply reason and common sense to nearly every part of life. Now, when, when I say reason, I mean we th something that can be proven with facts. They believed everything comes down to a factual world. And so they talk about applying reason to all parts of life. Now, interestingly... When we talk about these, this movement, the Enlightenment, and these different philosophes or thinkers, they actually weren't an organized group of people. They didn't belong to some, you know, political party like we have today or some sort of religious movement. Um, they weren't an organized group of guys. And in fact, they disagreed with each other on a lot of issues and they didn't necessarily like or respect each other. A lot of some of these writers, their entire pieces of work, set out to simply undermine and call the other guy stupid, in essence. And so they didn't necessarily get along. But So when we talk about the Enlightenment, we're talking about a time period where you have a group of thinkers, writers, philosophers, who are talking about all these different ideas. And so we bundle them all together in this time period called the Enlightenment even though they all sort of disagree on different things once in a while. So what binds them together was what the book calls, quote, 
they were members of a wider intellectual movement who were dedicated to understanding and publicizing the cause of human betterment. What they all were trying to get at was, how can mankind improve ourselves? What can people do to make ourselves and make society and make our economies better? That's what they were trying to do. So these philosophes, they proved the major source of ideas that were used to undermine existing social and political structures or the old regime. So through their writing and through their critiques, they tried to change the way people thought and tried to undermine the way things used to be. Now, there were, there's really two influences on the Enlightenment. Or actually, I'm sorry, three. We should say, so when we think about the Enlightenment, now we kind of know what it was. We kind of know what they stood for. Now let's talk about, so where did these ideas come from? What, what are the roots of the Enlightenment? Or what were the influences that started the Enlightenment? Well, there were really three. There were some, there were some thinkers. There was a movement of print. And there was a living example, Great Britain. So the first, intellectually, I would say the Enlightenment thinkers owe much of what they write about to Sir Isaac Newton and John Locke. These two guys and their writing basically kind of set the stage for all the writing to come. John, uh, let's, let's first take a look at, at Newton. Newton's work in physics, you know, you might remember the story of the guy sitting underneath a tree uh, with the apple hitting his head. Well... That story is kind of nonsense. But in essence, Newton's work in physics, basically what he emphasized was empirical evidence and rationality. What that means is empirical evidence is a fancy way of saying you test it with science and you get data or information and you prove it. It gives you info. So next, then, you've got John Locke. And Locke argues that Man's nature is changeable, and it can be improved. So what Locke is known for, and this is going to sound familiar, he was one of the first people to promote the idea that a government can only exist from the consent of the governed. All right? I'm going to say that again. Government can only exist from the consent of the governed. And he also was the first person to say, and I use quotes because he quoted this, people have the right to quote life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. Now that might sound familiar as, you know, in our American government, we talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thomas Jefferson got his idea from John Locke. So our founding fathers um, really took a lot of these concepts from John Locke and incorporated them into the creation of our own constitution. Now, the other thing that we talked about was the abundance of print. Printed material, or the printing of paper stuff, began to widely be distributed all over Europe. And so much stuff was being published and printed that what it does is it leads to this new social force called public opinion. Now, when you hear that, that's to us, that's like, well, duh, yeah, of course the public has a certain opinion on things. Well, prior to the mid-18th century, 17th century way of thinking, when print was widely distributed, there was no such thing as public opinion because the public didn't know what was going on because they didn't read about it. As this stuff started being published, as these guys started promoting their ideas on paper, people started forming their own thoughts for themselves. So this leads to the creation of public opinion. What a large, what the majority of society has to say about a specific issue. Next is Great Britain as a living example. So intellectually, the Enlightenment has roots in the work of Newton and Locke. Print, basically these guys could print their stuff and distribute it to large groups of people. And next, the Enlightenment thinkers, as they started writing, said, look at Great Britain. This is a per this." This country is a wonderful example of what an enlightened society should be. And they, they had a couple examples. And in this time period, England permitted relative religious tolerance. There was also a, a tolerance of freedom of press 
and freedom of speech compared to other European nations. The other interesting thing is that the power of the king, or the monarchy, was limited, and the courts protected, for the most part, the common citizen. So all in all, England was a significantly freer place than any other European monarchy at the time. So, to rehash, the Enlightenment was a movement, a social movement of ideas, of a way of thinking that challenged uh, the way things used to be. These thinkers, or what the term we used, philosophes, wanted change and reform in society. And the Enlightenment has root in Locke and Newton. The fact that the Enlightenment was able to spread because of all the print that was going on. And Great Britain offered a good example of what society should look like. So what we're going to look at next in the next video is the Enlightenment and how they viewed religion. Let's take a look.